Welcome to this lecture about security. Uh, I won't cover everything about computer security, of course. This will just be a little, some parts that I think uh, is needed uh, for your uh, final exam, uh, examination. Uh, and the th first thing we will talk about is about cryptography. Uh, encryption and certificates and SSH and public and private keys. We have uh, discussed some of these before, but not in, in some depth. So we will cover this. Uh, another thing that we haven't talked about is permission. How do you set permission in the, on the file system, on the users? What can they do in the systems? Um, and the final part will be about the network. How do we secure the network with firewalls and DMCs? So cryptography is a really big area. We will cover some basic principles. Uh, it has four main purposes. Uh, the first thing that you probably think about is encryption. Uh, and this is when you want to send a message from one sender to a destination and don't want anyone else to read that message. Uh, another thing that's included in cryptography is authentication. You want, let's say that uh, uh, we have Bob who wants to uh, verify that Alice uh, is actually Alice. We use this when we are connecting to systems uh, to authenticate ourselves. Uh, another thing is integrity. We want the message that has been sent, we want to know that that hasn't changed on the way. So we need some way to, to check that this message is the same message that we sent. And the, the final part is something called non-repudiation, uh, which is that I should know who the sender really is. He can't uh, deny that he sent this message uh, after he sent it. We need some way to check that the sender is really that sender. And we can do this uh, with some different uh, techniques. The simplest one is some sort of secret key. Uh, we have a sender. He has some sort of message in which he wants uh, only the receiver part to be able to read. So he encrypts this with a, a key. It has some sort of key. And some sort of algorithm that transform this message according to this uh, key. And then the receiver has the same key. He knows the same key and can decrypt the message. This has been used for centuries. Caesar uh, did this during the Roman times. He just moved the alphabet some steps and took the na next characters. And, and that was quite a simple uh, secret key, how many steps you move the, the alphabet. Uh, the algorithms as today are quite uh, more sophisticated. But we only have one key here. The same key for both encryption and decryption. So we usually call this uh, symmetric encryption. And as you can realize on the internet where we want to distribute these keys, this could be a problem. It's hard to know that this key doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Because anyone who has this, this secret key can decrypt the messages. But it's a, a good encryption if we can know that only the two parts or the parts that should have the key have the key. Another way is something called public key cryptography. Here we have two keys and they are created um, together so they have a special bond. Uh, we can encrypt with both and 
the, the key that we uh, encrypt with can't decrypt the message again. The only key that can decrypt is the other key. So you could say that you have a special lock. If you, you can lock the door with one key, but if you try to open it again, it won't open. You have to have the other key to open the door. And so what we do here at, is that we can distribute this public key for an, to anyone. And say, OK, if you want to send a private message to me, encrypt your message with my public key. Now, anyone who gets this me message before I could get it, they can't decrypt it because they also only have the public key and it, the public key can't uh, decrypt the message. But I, on the other hand, who has the private key, can decrypt the message. And these texts that you can see are actually working. So if you want to try it out, you can. <laughs> uh, usually you can see, you don't see this in, in this slide, but in the head of the, the text, you have some sort of description which, uh, which type of encryption you're using and, and, uh, and the version so that you know how to decrypt the message. Uh, so if we want two parties to be able to communicate with, the, with each other, they both need to have a set of keys. Both should have one public and one private key, and then they distribute the public key to the other party. And now when he sends a message, he or she can decry uh, encrypt with the public key, and the receiver can then decrypt with his private. Uh, another part of cryptography is hash functions. So this doesn't involve any key or any secret. Uh, this is just a way to we have some sort of hashing function. Uh, SHA1 is one of these uh, functions. And they take a message, it can be of any size, and then convert that to a fixed length hash. And you can't get back the message from this part. You, but if you have the message, you can run it through the function and get the same hash again. If you use the same hash function, it will always be the same hash you get back. So you can use this um, to check the integrity of messages. So if I hash my message and then I encrypt it, uh, I will include both the, the encrypted message and the hash when I send it to the other party. Then the other party could decrypt the message, run the same hash function and see, OK, this message hasn't changed. It is the same as the uh, first party sent. So we use this public keys uh, in certificates. Uh, certificates are really just a digital signed document. Uh, it includes some different things. I will go through that in a moment. But it can verify the validity of the public key, so we know that this is uh, the one who published this has the private key. Um, it also usually describes what can we do with this key. Is it OK to, to encrypt messages or, or uh, as a validation of the web server? Or what should we do with this key? So there are some standards. Uh, in certificates, I think one called X509. Uh, a certificate can, since it's just a, a digital signed document, it can include almost anything. Uh, but this is what the standard uh, tells, uh, says what it should be included in, uh, in the standard format. We have a serial number, which is a unique identifier for the certificate. We have a subject. 
which is the well you can you can uh, create a certificate for me as a person uh, you probably will have a certificate in your wallet right now you have that on your uh, visa card or master card the little chip you have that in that there is a uh, certificate and that's probably the subject in that is probably your your ID at the bank or your social security number or something like that uh, in a web server the subject would probably be the URL that you want to verify. Uh, then it states which algorithm is, uh, is used when signing this. It has a signature. And the signature is actually just uh, something that is encrypted with the, the private key. It could be the, the subject or something. So that when you get this certificate, you have a part that is uh, encrypted with the private key and then you since this also includes the public key you can decrypt that part and then you see okay this is uh, this is the signature and we can see that that whoever who created this certificate has the pub private key otherwise he couldn't encrypt that message uh, we have something called issuer that is the party that issued this certificate. I will come to that in a moment. Uh, we also have the validity of the uh, certificate. So from what date to what date is this a valid uh, certificate? All certificates has these. Uh, so they will, uh, after a while, become obsolete and you can't use them anymore. You have to renew the certificate. We have the key use. What can we use this public key for? It could be, can I sign things with it? Um, or uh, can I, we can use certificate to sign our codes. So uh, the, if that's okay to do with this, then that will be stated here. Uh, we also have a thumbprint, also called a fingerprint. Uh, and that's the hash, so that it will be hashed, this entire document, and that will be the hash. So you can check that this hasn't changed. So we have one problem here with certificates. Uh, anyone can send Bob a message, or Alice. Uh, but how do we know uh, that the key belongs to Bob. I could create a, a certificate with the name of Bob or whatever it should be and then distribute that and say, okay, I'm Bob, send me a message. So the solution here is something called a public key infrastructure. Uh, and it's built on a, a trust chain. We have some party uh, that we have agreed upon that we, 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 we trust this part, party. So when Alice wants to have a, a, a certificate, she can contact one of these authorities and say, okay, I have uh, created a key pair here and I want a certificate. Uh, they will then check that, okay, this is really Alice or this is really the web server or the email address or what you want to have a certificate for. And then they sign this certificate. So they become the issuer of the certificate. But remember here, this is only the public key. The private key never leaves the web server or uh, the thing. So, so the authority here doesn't know the private key. But it's say because other computers in the world uh, trust these uh, root certificates. Uh, they will trust what they ever issue. Um, so it could look something like this. We have down here the root uh, certificate authority have one certificate with the private uh, and the public key. Uh, they could issue 
another one's certificate and they will sign, they will have a signed signature on that certificate. So when I want to verify that this certificate, I don't know the, the person who uh, are trying to give me his public key. But I have installed on my computer the root certificate. And I could check the signature here. Okay, it has been signed by these guys, and I trust these guys. Therefore, I will trust this one. And if oh, we can use it like this. If this root certificate authority, uh, they can issue special certificates that are allowed to create certificates in their name. Uh, you as a private citizen probably can't purchase one of these certificates. They are really expensive and they will uh, uh, look at this organization and really inspect that, okay, can we really trust them? Because it's our name that they will put on their certificates that they are signing. But they can do this and then they can assign uh, signed certificates on other part. You will see this in, in web service when you look at the certificate you probably see a chain of certificates. So I have some slides about how this works. Um, I don't know if you can see them, quite small probably, but let's say a new certificate authority is created. What will they do then? This isn't you as a web developer. This is another organization. Uh, they will generate a key pair. And then they will sign that uh, document themselves. And by default, no one will trust that certificate, of course. Uh, but then they make uh, they will talk to uh, web browser developers and maybe uh, Microsoft or, or Linux. Okay, you can trust us. They will somehow state and, and, and be verified that they can be trusted. So some web uh, browsers will install their root certificates by default. So when you as a regular person install their web browser, some root certificate will be installed alongside that web browser. And also operating system has some uh, certificate authorities installed by default. <coughs> so let's say that you as a web developer uh, wants to have a certificate on your web server. Then you start the same way. You generate a key pair. And then you create something called a CSR, a certificate signed request. That only includes the public key and some information. What will I use this certificate for? Uh, and how long does it want it to be valid? Then you send in this request to one of the uh, certificate authorities. It could be the company we just talked about. Uh, they will look through this. It will have a, it will be signed with a private key so we can see, okay, the person who sent in this document, this certificate signing request, has the private key. It will also look based on what you want to do with this certificate and how much money you will pay for it. Uh, they will uh, look through your company or if it's a cheap certificate they will probably just check that you actually have that domain name that you want to use this certificate for. And they can do that by uh, you have to supply an email address that is in the same domain as the one that you want to use. But the process of this validation can be uh, quite big depending on what you want to do with the certificate. Uh, if that everything checks out, they will sign it with their uh, with their key, and you will get back 
the signed certificate and <clears throat> install that on your web server or what, where you want to use it. Then we have some random person who wants to go to your website. And you have configured the web server to use SSL encryption and you have installed this certificate. So when somebody tries to contact at the web server, they say, okay, I want to have an encryption here. Uh, they will get the public, the, the certificate. If we look through it, they could actually have that certificate installed on their computer. They, then they won't check for the authority person or the authorities. It will just accept that, okay, you have, I, I trust this certificate. Uh, but usually they will check who signed this document and check that it's valid. A certificate usually also includes a um, revoke and center URL so that the certificate authority can have a, a place where they have a list of certificates that they have, have had to um, delete because some, someone did something bad with them. So a revoke and list is probably uh, included also, so they could check that this certificate isn't in that list. But if everything checks okay, they will start to have an encryption between them. I will have an example on how that works later on. So that is the, the process of how uh, public key infrastructure works. So, to look at this more in depth, this is a slide from, from John's course. Um, a client connects to the port 443, which is a standard port for SSL. Um, it requests the identity of the server. The server sends a copy of the certificate. Um, and then the browser will check the list of trusted authority. It could be in the web browser or it could be installed on the computer. It depends a bit about the, the browser. Some browsers don't have certificates installed with them. They, they just state, okay, if you want to, to use certificate, check the computer, which certificate does he uh, trust. And if that checks out, he will encrypt a, a key uh, with the public uh, key from the web server and send that back. And now the web server will get that key because he can decrypt it and then they will start a symmetric encryption so that the client doesn't have to have a certificate also. So the actual communication between the server and the client will be a symmetric encryption. Um, we can use uh, keys to log on to, to servers with SSH. This is not a, a certificate, this is a, just private and public keys, asymmetric keys. So these are only used for authentication. And what you do is you run a command called SSH keygen, which will create this key pair. And it will ask you where you want to store this certificate. These are private. This should be only for you as a person. So they will install under your user account and under a folder called uh, .ssh. The default name is id-rsa. Uh, but you can change that to whatever you want. Then it will ask for a, a key phrase. You should always use a key phrase. You can say that the key phrase with that when you, that becomes the key for you to open up this private key. So you will put the, the private key in a box and you will lock it with this passcode, the passphrase. So that should be a, a good uh, password. Uh, and then it will create two files. So, uh, 
the name that you stated before and dot pub. That is the public. And the public you can distribute as you wish. But the private should never leave that computer actually. Now that you have a, a passphrase on it, it's a bit more secure, uh, but it should be on the same computer. Then you can use a command called uh, SSH copy ID to move the public uh, key to the remote computer which you want to uh, sign into. It will put that public in a folder dot SSH slash authenticate authorized keys, I think. We'll have a document with just the public keys. So if you put a public key in that file, the person who has the private key can authenticate themselves. Then you just state SSH, the user and the IP, and then it, you will use that key to authenticate yourself. Uh, I know that you have had some problems with, we have used this uh, in our lab cloud, uh, but we have something called an SSA agent, uh, which will load your, your, your keys into memory so they can be used during that session. And that will stop if you end the session, so you have to restart that and add the key again. But you could always use this last one here to expressly uh, say, explicitly say, I want to use this public key to authenticate with that server. So with a dash i, you will specify the, the file path for that key. But if you have, as I recommend, entered the passphrase, then you will have to add that, uh, enter that passphrase to be able to open up the, the box that has the private key. Okay. So let's leave the encryption and the cryptography uh, for now and talk a little bit about file permissions. And in Linux, it is quite simple. Uh, it's much more complicated in, in Windows actually. Uh, and usually this depends on the file system that you have, but the most usually used file system in Linux will use this same approach. So it doesn't uh, differ that much. We have permission groups. We have the owner of the file or the folder. We have the group that is connected to that file or uh, directory. And we have everyone else on the system. These are the three different groups. And then we have the types of permissions. And here we only have read, write, and execute. So it's quite simple, actually. And of course, the read, if you have read permission, then you will be able to read the content. You can list the content of the directory. Uh, or uh, the uh, content of the file. If you write, you could delete, you could create files, and you can mo uh, modify them. And with execute, you can, if this would be a script or a program, uh, then you could actually execute that program or the script. So if you list the contents of a folder, with the argument dash l, you will get something, something like this. I think this is from my my uh, OS 10, uh, so it could be a bit different in Linux, but about the same. Uh, so the interesting part here is the first one when we talk about permissions, and. The first character, this one, is a little spe is a special flag. Uh, as you can see, it in this case, when we have a directory, 
it will state that it's a directory. You could see if it's a linked file and, and some other things. Um, and the next three sets of character is the permission for the owner of that file. And R is for read, W is for write, E is for execute, uh, X is for execute. So as you can see, the first one, the folder, the owner of that folder has full permission. It can read, write, and execute that. The next set of characters is for the group. So each folder or file has a grouped group owner, you can say, of that specific file. And it's the same way there. And the last three characters is for everyone else. So you could see that this admin folder, it can be read and executed by everyone on my system. But it cannot create new files, it can't edit files, and it can't delete files within that directory. So how do we change this? We use a command called smod or shmod, stands for change uh, the permission of the file or folder. It will be the same as if, uh, if it's a file or a folder. Uh, if you want every file and folders under the specific folder that you're trying to edit, you should set the the argument dash B, uh, capital R, then it will be recursive. And then they have added some numbers. Uh, so a four, you will get read. A two, you will get uh, write, and one, you will get execute. And then you can combine these. So if I want uh, someone to have read and write, I will just add 4 and 2 together, so we will state 6. So when in this example down here, I shmod 600 for the readme file, and there we see I, for that readme file, now only the owner has read and write, and no one else has any. So 0 is none. So it's quite easy. If you want to change the owner, you can use chown for changing the ownership. And then you just state the name of the user, colon, the group. And then the file name or folder. Here you can also have the, the capital R argument if you want it to be recursive. Windows permissions, when we talk about files, are a bit different. <coughs> uh, here we have for the different permissions for directories and for files. So we have read, write, and execute. We have modify and full control. And on the folder we have list content also. But these are actually groups of permissions. So if you want to look uh, on the permissions that you can set on a directory, it's actually all of these permissions. But they have grouped them into logical uh, groups, so it will be easier for us to use. And all this is on the file system that is used on Windows called NTFS. So these are functions on NTFS. If you have uh, a in file system called FAT32 or 16, this won't apply. So it's not the Windows operating system that has this feature, it's the file system. And on the file, it's the same. We have very granular control on files and folders. And you can also set how inheritance work. 
uh, NTFS permissions will be inherited by default from the parent folder. And the file that you create inside the folder will uh, inherit the permissions of the folder that it lies in. You can block this inheritance. And when you block it, you will be asked if you want to copy uh, the permissions or remove them. If you remove them, the, the, the file or the folder that you are blocking uh, will have no permissions. So you have to add them manually. If you copy, they will have the same as the parent folder, but no longer uh, have any subscription for changes. So if you add users or uh, delete users, they won't reflect uh, the subfolders. And how does it do this? Every file or folder in an NTFS volume has something called an access control list, an ACL. And it contains a list of user groups or even computers and what they can do. Uh, every entry in this list is called an uh, access control entry. If a user or a group or a computer is not in the list, it will be implicitly denied access to the file or folder. You can set deny for read. Then we say that you explicitly ha has uh, denied access. Usually, <coughs> we don't recommend that you use deny because it makes it hard to troubleshoot. So you should be fine if you're doing it the correct way with not using explicit denies. Because a anyone who isn't in a group or uh, uh, implicit, uh, explicitly allowed access won't be allowed. So here you can see some example of it. We have an ACL for a, uh, for a folder. We have one user who we have uh, set the read permission. We then had set a deny write for user 2. User 3 is not in the list, so it's implicitly denied access. And then we have a group 1 which has full control. And the difference between full control and, and read and write is that if you have full control, you can change the permission. That is the biggest uh, difference between them. So you should be really careful with granting full control for anyone who's not an administrator. And then these will be applied to the folders on the files and folders under that folder. But uh, as I said, we shouldn't do what we did here with user 2. Also, deny has a higher priority than allow. So let's say that user 2 was in the group 1. Then it would be able to change the permission, but it won't be able to write. So it could change that, of course. But. OK, what happens with permission when we move files? Because if we have this inheritance, we have to pay attention to this. And this could be a bit different. Let's say we have one volume. We have a petition. And we copy files from one directory to another. Then the, the permission that was on that file won't exist anymore. It will inherit that from the newly, um, where the, it was moved to, or it, it was copied to. And that seems logical. But on the other hand, if we move a file from one folder to another, it will keep its original uh, permission. And you can ask yourself, why is that? This is, sounds really strange. But <clears throat> and, and to uh, understand that, you actually need to go deeper into the file system. But you probably have seen this also 
if you are a Windows user, when you move a copy a big file from one directory to another, it will take some time. Let's say you copy a five gigabyte file, it will take a couple of seconds to copy that because it needs to write that in a new place on the hard disk. But if you move a file, it's instant. And that's because it doesn't actually move anything. It just updates the file system has a table on where are the files in my this petition. And it, won't, it will only update that index and say, okay, this file now says that it's in this folder and you will locate it on this part of the hard disk. And then when you move the file, it will have the same permission. So it will have blocked the inheritance from the newly add, the folder that it was added to. But on the other hand, if you move or copy a file from one partition of volume to another NTFS volume, it will always inherit. And that's because it has to write the data to the new volume. So how do you change permissions in Windows? Uh, you can use the graphical interface to do that. You just right click on the file or the folder and get uh, properties. And there you have a tab called security. If you don't have the tab security, it's not an NTFS volume. If you click that, you can then see the, this you can say is the ACL. And this is the ACE. And below, now have checked the creative owner account here, and then it will state that what permission it has. And as you see, it doesn't have any permission, it's, it looks like. But if you scroll d further down, you will have something called special permission. And that is stated when you, the, the, the permission that that specific user or group has isn't one of these grouped uh, permissions. So that uh, the creative owner has some sort of special permission, so it can't say which one of these it actually has. You have to go into an advanced tab to look on the specific rights for that user. And if we go into the advanced, it will look quite different. But here we also have the ACL. And then you could, here you can block inheritance. If you click that, you will get, at, get the question, do you want to copy or uh, remove the permissions? Uh, you could change the owner of that file or folder. And the owner is important if you're using the group creative owner. I talked about that in Active Directory. And it's important for a lot of things. It's important if you calculate uh, quotas for users because that will be calculated on which files and folders that user owns. Uh, if you click one of these, you will get uh, the exact information about that permissions. So it, in this case, is probably read and execute that's been applied. But here you see the different uh, permission that have been added. So that creative owner probably has some special uh, settings here. You could specify also where this should apply to. So you could set that this settings only applies to this folder and the files in it. But if you create a subfolder, these settings, these permissions won't uh, traverse down to that folder. So you can be really granular with your permissions on Windows. So that makes it more complex and hard to set up. But 
there are a good strategy, which I will come to in a bit. After the break, we will talk about window shares. So we have a 10 minute break. Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, window shares. Uh, Windows has built-in support for sharing directories. <clears throat> and it uses a protocol. I won't go into depth about that protocol. But it's called, uh, if you want to look it up, it's SMB. It has a different version, I think, in Windows Server 2012. It's version 3. Uh, but it's really easy to share a folder in Windows. Uh, so what this does, of course, it will make these available to other users in the network with this be able to connect to it. Uh, if you don't have NTFS installed on that uh, partition, uh, if you use uh, FAT32 uh, or something like that instead, then we have permissions on the specific share. But we don't have permissions later, uh, further down the chain. So we have permissions on the share itself, but no directory or file permissions. On NTFS volumes, you have both. And this could be a bit confusing. If you share a folder um, and the share permission is only read, then it doesn't matter if they have full control of the file or the folder they're trying to access. It, they won't be able to, to write or change that file. And that can be hard to uh, troubleshoot, uh, but you have to know that this is how it works. So we have one permission for the share, and then we have the NTFS permissions on the directories and folders. And how do we share a folder in the graphical interface? Again, we just right click that folder, and then we get this dialog. Uh, and there we have a tab called sharing. This is also where you find the security tab, which we discussed before. And you could use that share button, but I wouldn't recommend it because then you don't get as much uh, settings as you would like. Uh, I would recommend that you use the advanced sharing uh, button. And then when you click that, you will get this next dialog, the advanced sharing dialog, where you will check or tick the share this folder. And it will get a share name. It doesn't have to be the same as the folder name. Give me another name. You could change how uh, many simultaneous users could connect to it. By default, it's, I don't know, 16 thousand, something like that. I think this is the ma maximum number. Uh, you should then enter the permission. And then you will get this dialog. And <clears throat> if you have NTFS installed and you have the proper security and permissions on that file system and the folders, then you should allow everyone to change. They won't be able to do the change, but if they don't have change here, they, the real permissions won't be uh, added to them. You probably would add also an administrator group that has full control so that they can change um, the ACLs um, from the network. Otherwise, they have to log on locally on that file server. And the same thing here with the, the sharing permissions. They are quite granular, and you can make, be, be very specific. But since we have the control uh, with the permissions for the NTFS, we usually only use the change in the full control group permissions. OK, I said earlier that there are some strategies on how to 
set permission. Uh, something called role-based access control. This isn't specific for Windows. This is a way you should grant access in your system. It, it's not specific to, to files and folders. It could be anything that has some sort of ACL, some sort of control list. It could be a printer. It could be a, a database server. Uh, it could be almost anything that supports some sort of permissions to be set. And the thought here is that you shouldn't assign permission to directly to an individual account, a computer or a user. You should, the user or the computer should get their access through a role in which they are within the organization. So let's say that you have an organization uh, where you have different departments. You have sales, marketing, production, or whatnot. Um, then you should get the permission based on your working uh, tasks. Um, and Windows or Microsoft has developed this strategy called AGDLP uh, to uh, use this role-based access control. And when we talked about, you have to have Active Directory to use this approach. Uh, so the file server in which you want to grant permission or the database server has to be included in the Active Directory, so it has to be joined to that domain. Uh, we have the A that stands for the user account. That is put into global groups. We talked about different groups that are included in Active Directory. They should be in global groups, specifically for their tasks. It could be that you have a group for the marketing department. Or you could have a group for the marketing uh, managers. So based on their job role in the company. And they could be a part of a lot of groups, uh, depending on the task. It could be that you're in uh, development and you ha are connected to five different projects. You probably would have a, a, a global catalog, uh, <laughs> a global group for the different projects. Because you need to have permission uh, divided between these different projects. Um, and then we have something that we want to set permissions on. It could be a file or a folder. Uh, we then specify a domain local group that signifies that permission. So let's say that we have this shared folder uh, called um, sales uh, managers where the sales manager should put files about the different sales that are working on right now. It shouldn't be able to be accessed or, or modified by a, a, a sales representative. It's just for the, the managers. Then you create uh, domain local groups for that specific share. So you probably say, let's say a domain local group called uh, file server 2 uh, dash marketing uh, manager dash modify. And then you apply that permission on that folder. So you then say what that name states. Okay, we have marketing. We take that group and set that permission. So uh, then if that same group would have a specific printer that they only should use, then you could use the same, uh, you create a new domain local group that states printed five um, marketing uh, managers print. So they will be able to print that. So when we get a new user or starting that department, we just add that to the global group. Then maybe we have 15 different domain local groups which give them permissions out in our system. So we don't have to go to that specific printer or that folder or that database and get grant access for that specific user. And this helps us really a lot as administrators. Uh,
I, I think I will clear it up a bit more. Uh, because it, it's a really good approach. If I could write. We should look at the organization chart that our company has when we try to build it. Usually when you come out in the company, they will have some approach probably based on this. But we could have uh, the CEOs, and then we have some admin department under that. We maybe have the uh, developers, and we could have sales. Then we should create the uh, global group structure that is based on the different needs here. The dev could be divided into different groups also, of course. So we will create, we usually when we create these, we, we start with a G when we're naming them, so we easily can separate them from the permission groups. So G for global group and then ADM. Uh, and then it could have different <coughs> subgroups for, on the different tasks. We have one for dev, and we have one for sales. Uh, we then have a lot of different resources which this should use. We will have a, a file server, FS01, which has a different, different shares. We could say sales. So that's a folder uh, which been shared. We could also have a database server, uh, which is for dev. They will probably have a lot of different databases. Uh, so. We then, when we are creating these as administrators, when we are creating the new share, we should always also create the domain local groups for the different uh, tasks. So for a share, uh, you probably will need read, write, and maybe full control. So then you create domain local groups, uh, DL for sales, read, the same and dash write, or I usually call it modify, uh, actually because write, then you can both delete, create, and, uh, and modify the file. And then maybe uh, F for full control. You should probably also state in which server, so maybe before it says you have FS01, so you know where this resource lies because these groups are created on our Active Directory domain controller. It's not created on the file server or the database server. That's the big advantage we'd have in an Active Directory. And then we do the same thing with the dev database. We create the domain, let's say, D, db1, the server is called, uh, dl db O one dash dev and the specific permission. It could be anything. So you could create a lot of these, even if we don't have any global groups connected to them for now. We could think ahead and script this and do this for all our, because if nobody is in, uh, in that group, they won't get that permission. So it, the best thing is when you set up the resource, you also create all these different uh, permission groups. And then you look at the organization and talk to all the people. What does the admin or the dev or the salespeople need for type of resources? And then you just add, let's say dev, you make them uh, a member of that group. And you do the same thing, whatever different 
type of scenario. So when an administration uh, person, when she wants to leave that department and maybe move to sales, we only have to move that account to the correct global group and that she will get every uh, resource that she needs to complete her work. So it's a really good strategy. It will take some time when you set up new resources. But when you have set up that resource, you can administer permission just by administrating the Active Directory, just by moving users and, and groups, uh, the membership of them. So you never have to log on to the file server or the database server, never again, after you have set up this up. So it's a really good strategy. You can't use the exact same in Linux because they don't have groups in groups support. Uh, so this should be only for a Windows or Microsoft uh, system. But if you have Active Directory installed, it, this would be a good approach. And a lot of uh, company uses this or a similar approach when they are creating uh, their structure. Let's see what happened to my presentation. Okay, that's it for the, the permissions. There are, as you can imagine, quite a lot more you can talk about, but we will give you some resources. I think this is what you need to be able to, uh, to create, uh, create your environments. I will make some demos on how to do this, how to set, up, set it up also. I haven't talked about how to set permissions in Windows from the command line. And from PowerShell, it is a pain. They haven't implemented a good strategy for that yet. They have two commands, set and get ACL. Uh, but if you set an ACL, you have to supply uh, an ACL uh, object. And there's no way to create one. So you can get, when you use the get command, get ACL, then you will get this object and then you can apply that with set ACL on other folders. But how do you create it? Then you have to, you can do it uh, and it's not a pretty sight. Uh, you create objects on the .NET framework and apply them uh, there. There are uh, some guys who made a plugin to PowerShell, which makes this easier. So probably I will show that on the, in a demo. Firewalls. <coughs> there are Usually we talk about security groups when we talk about how to create, uh, secure our networks. And we usually talk about different rings. We have the first ring, the internet ring, which is the last frontier in, uh, before the internet. Uh, we have, this is a quite a big company as you can imagine. Uh, we have different maybe cities or different uh, apartments that have different network subnets. Then we should have something called the backbone edge, where we have firewall between these different parts. And then we have the asset network, and that this is where our actual assets lies, our servers, our clients, uh, and printers, and stuff like that. And the final frontier is the local host security, and that is the firewall installed on your physical computer. So the internet edge is the first uh, attack point, you can say. Uh, this is the, the ring that is exposed to the outside network. And common mistakes here are that you're putting in a very expensive and powerful uh, intelligent firewall that can do a lot of things. But what you don't maybe realize is that most of your attacks will come from inside your network. Here you should put a really high performance firewall that is able to shuffle data really fast. It ha doesn't have the time to inspect the traffic too much. And in the 
backbone edge, this is between the internal networks and the internet edge. Here you can uh, allow traffic, the, the total volume of traffic is, is less than from the internet edge, of course. So here you can do some more uh, deep uh, inspection of the package. Um, you usually have something called dynamic application layer filtering where you can look at the different applications that are trying to uh, use the network. Is the traffic valid for that type of application? So let's say we have a DNS server uh, and you can see, okay, this is DNS traffic because it's based on port 53, but the packages inside this isn't DNS records or it's something else, then the firewall could block that or tell an administrator. So we could uh, look at the traffic on, on a more application layer. And then you have the asset network edge. And here the package filtering, the, the package filtering firewalls are just looking at the port and destination, uh, sort of. So it doesn't uh, inspect the traffic as much. Uh, here you need to also, if you have an, a, a big organization, you need to know which user is doing what in your network. You need to be able to log that. So if you have a person inside of your organization who are trying to do something stupid, then you should be able to locate that person. Uh, because you could have, uh, if you're an um, you're working uh, uh, for the government or stuff like that, they need to be able to find the responsible person for the material. So here you have to look at the, 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 the packages that are going out also, not only in to the network. Uh, you also have application that are using the network. You need to be able to log that. And uh, we have the final ring, the local host security. And this is the, the last defense that you have. And usually uh, not used at all uh, for some reason. This is a very important part. No firewall of the, of the other firewalls, if we go back to the picture. Do, do, do. Uh, this is one subnet, you could say. And traffic going inside this network ne that never leaves the network won't go through any firewalls. Not the asset management, not the backbone, and not the internet edge. So it doesn't have anything to inspect that traffic. So when you try to contact another server or a client within that local network, that there will be nothing to, to check that traffic. You could set up some sort of proxy and stuff like that, but usually the, the, the local area network is unsafe uh, in that manner. So as you can imagine then, the local host security is quite important. And when we talk about local host security, it's not only the firewall. We talk about how we uh, secure the local system. Uh, and here you can, with, with firewalls, usually they are included in the operating system, but you could download other firewalls. So this is a software firewall. The other firewalls could be a hardware firewall, an appliance that you buy in your company. Um, you should have antivirus system uh, installed. Uh, you should have the application and uh, operating system up to date. And you should think about anti-spyware, spam, and stuff like that on the local system. So this is not only for servers, this is also for, for your clients. Um, you should have the users running and the services with minimal permissions. Uh, in Linux, we use sudo, so m many users are regular users that don't have permission uh, to do a lot of things. So we use the sudo command 
to grant ourselves higher permission to do execute the things that we want to do. But you should realize that when you're using sudo, you are not that user anymore. You are a root account. You can do almost anything. But regular users won't be able to use sudo because they are not in a special group uh, that you know, are able to run the sudo command. But the picture I showed you before is for a quite a big company. Uh, usually we have smaller networks which we don't need all these rings. Uh, you should, however, put your publicly accessed server and services uh, in a separate network. We usually call that a DMC. Um, in a very simple network, or many companies, it will only have one firewall that is uh, the internet edge. But the important thing here is to remember, don't forget about the local host security. You should never disable the firewall. If you have pro problems, well, you could disable the firewall when you're troubleshooting, but you should always then enable it again and, and open up the correct port and stuff. So the DMC, uh, it's a, a network that is placed in a neutral zone between the corporate internal network and the internet. Um, and we do this because we want if one server is penetrated and get accessed from uh, a villain, what we call him, he won't be able to access the internal network. Uh, so what should we put in this network? It should be stuff that are publicly accessed. So web servers, the publicly DNS servers, FTP servers, yeah, stuff that you want to be able to access from with outside of your network. Um, I will have a lot of demos to do uh, the next week uh, on this topic, but I hope you get a bit more security knowledge from this lecture. Uh, do we have any questions? We will, as usual, have a group discussion afterwards. Doesn't seem that we have any questions. Okay, we will take the. Oh, sorry. No. No. Uh, then we will take the questions in the group uh, discussion in, uh, uh, let's say, f five minutes. So uh, thank you for this. Oh, yeah, one more thing. We have. Uh, this is the last lecture. Uh, that I will have. We have a, a guest lecture coming on Monday, uh, Marcus Wilhelmsson, and he will talk about his journey uh, towards DevOps-ish, he says. So uh, he, he used to be a teacher here uh, at the, the IT technician program, so he's more of a back end, but he has made some travel towards uh, DevOps. So that will be good and fun to hear about. So that's on Monday, 1 p.m. 1.15 p.m., yeah. So thank you and goodbye. <laughs>